good morning. Uh, today is Tuesday and, excuse me, Wednesday, and I believe it's March the 2nd. So, yes, it is March the 2nd. So, it's kind of, this has been a crazy week and just keeping up with things is, is a little bit challenging, but um, we will do it, won't we? Hope you had a good night's rest last night. I sure did. And hope you enjoyed that time with Ephraim Silva yesterday. Um, it was good to have him. He's, he's just a great friend. Uh, this morning, I want to uh, remind you of a few prayer needs, uh, things that people are, are going through within the body, and I'm sure there are others that I'm not aware of, but if they are, would you post them in the comments so we can be praying for one another in different situations? Uh, Linda Williams is having a knee replacement this morning, and uh, Sandy's with her, and Sandy sent me a text and said they're supposed to take her back about right now. So be praying for Linda Williams as she undergoes hip replacement surgery today. And um, then uh, Bree Berry, Zach Berry's wife, Pastor Zach's wife, uh, she went home from the hospital on Monday evening. I shared with you yesterday that she was having some complications with her kidneys. And, and the real prayer is there's just a ton of fluid in her body. And so they're trying to get that fluid off. And they she went home from the hospital and um, she's doing well. She, she feels well on all of that, but just be praying. It's a lot of pressure on Zach to maintain things with a newborn baby. I think six months old now the baby is. And um, just a frustrating time for him uh, as well. Uh, with the new year and uh, things just getting in the way of what his plans were here in ministry, etc. So be praying for he and for Bree that she would recover quickly. And then Ken Moss uh, is at uh, Roddell Piedmont Hospital. And I'm not sure of all the details with Ken. Uh, Joan, if you're watching this morning, if you can just update us on that by putting a little information, we would appreciate it. We'd be praying for for Ken and pray for Joan as well. Uh, this has delayed her shoulder surgery that she needs. And so, so many other needs in the body, just be praying for one another. I wanna encourage you to make it tonight to our corporate prayer. Uh, that is 6 p.m. in the children's area. It's called First and Foremost, our time of prayer and worship. And it is a priority for us to seek the Lord. Uh, if, if we desire to see God move and God accomplish uh, what is in our heart for him through the body here at First Conyers. And we've got to seek him and pray. Only he can do what we cannot do. And so let's remember to pray for him. This morning, I, I, I love this old hymn. And, um, just wanted to do it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is
last time. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. This is my story. Let's sing it out. Is this your story? This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praise you, my Savior, all the day long. Only by the Holy Spirit can we praise Him all day long. And uh, <laughs> after yesterday morning, when Ephraim and I were talking about we can have a good, a good quiet time, come out of that quiet time with the Lord, and all of a sudden situations hit, uh, and that happened to me yesterday. And so we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit to. Um, Boy, just enable us daily to walk in fellowship with Him and, and not be uh, trying to gratify the desires of the flesh. Um, so anyway, John, thank you for posting that update about Ken. I had said earlier uh, in the devotion to be praying for Ken and praying for you, and so thanks for that update. Well, as you know, next Monday we are going to begin uh, our um, time in the book of Hebrews. And so today and tomorrow, I'm doing John chapter 20 and then John chapter 21. We'll concentrate more on the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ during Passion Week as I have some special devotions prepared for that week leading up to Easter. And so I just wanted to, to single out one thing, one part of the passage that, that really hit me this morning in my quiet time in John chapter 20. This is after the resurrection of Christ where Peter and John run to the tomb and Mary Magdalene is there, and um, she recognizes Christ. And uh, following that, after the resurrection, he comes into the upper room where his disciples were, were meeting and they were waiting there, and comes into the room. And in verse 19, we, we begin reading this in the passage. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, that would have been Sunday, the first day of the week, um, Jesus uh, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, now here Jesus is appearing for the first time to his disciples after the resurrection. And I, I love here Jesus' first words that he says to them, peace be with you. And um, that that was a common greeting um, in, in Jesus' day. But, but when Jesus spoke of peace, he spoke of, the Father's peace, peace from God that only He can give. Jesus said, peace I give to you, not as the world gives, uh, but my peace I give unto you. And so in that, in the meaning of that with Jesus, it, it has to do with the idea as well as now we have peace with the Father uh, because Christ has been, He's gone to the cross, He's paid for the penalty of our sins. Um, that that barrier between us and God has been removed, actually not removed, because there had to be judgment that was placed. And so our sins were placed on Christ, and uh, the judgment of God uh, came on Christ uh, where we should have deserved that. It, it came on Christ, and He bore not only our sins, but the judgment of our sins on the cross. And now as we've placed our faith and our trust in Christ, that, that barrier... We now have peace with God. 
where once we were enemies of God, not that God made us his enemies, the Bible said, but we made God our enemy by rejecting him and sinning against him. But now there has been a peace brokered, if you will, between us and God through the shed blood of Christ. And so Jesus says, peace be with you. I want you to realize this morning that if you've trusted Christ, boy, you have peace with the Father. There is peace with God there now. And only that peace can come from God through the work of Christ on the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so thank God this morning that we have peace with God, that he is no longer our enemies. He's broken down every wall, every barrier. And not only can we have peace, not only do we have peace with God through Christ, but we can also have peace with one another. And, boy, that's a beautiful thing. And so Jesus says, peace be you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands, the pierces in his hand. He showed them where he had been nailed to the cross. And he showed them the pierce in the side where we saw in the previous chapter where the soldier had pierced his side with the sword. And out from that piercing came uh, water and blood. Um, and so he shows them where he was pierced in the side as evidence. And we're going to see later that Thomas, doubting Thomas, is there in the chapter. Um, and so he showed them that. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They recognized that this was the risen Christ. He had risen from the dead. And we can only imagine that all of a sudden, all of the things that he had been saying to them, uh, that they didn't get before now, they finally got. They understood why he was, had come. Uh, they understood all of the things that he was saying in prediction of his death and how he must lay down his life for the sins of many. And I can only imagine the joy that they, um, they would have experienced at that time. The relief, if you will, uh, the, the, the full understanding. And I think back and remember when I finally understood the gospel message of Christ. And think back in your life when you finally understood the gospel message of Christ and you, you placed your trust in him. You remember the joy that you experienced at that time, the, the peace that probably flooded your heart and your mind um, some of us have different expressions during that time, but all of us, if we're born again, should be able to relate to a time or a season when we finally understood the gospel message of Christ and we placed our life in him. And, and we recognized that immediately there was a transformation that had taken place and began to take place and hopefully is continuing to take place in our life today. We never arrive on this side. We will never arrive fully. If someone gives the air that they've already arrived and they're holier than thou, um, that's indication that uh, they just don't get it. Uh, they've not arrived yet, but we will one day when Christ returns. Uh, see him as he is, and we ourselves will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And as he is, we will be also. And so he said again to them, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Now let me read the rest of these verses. I want to hit on the last verse to get that out of the way so we can see what Jesus is saying. Again, Jesus repeats, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now this was the initial giving of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit would come just a couple of days later at the day of Pentecost. Um, when, when the church would be, I said a couple of days, 40 days later, when the church would be born and the Holy Spirit is given. But this is the initial giving of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He says, Receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it will be withheld. Now, there's a lot of debate on this last verse. We know from Scripture that, that no one can forgive sins except God. 
You remember the instance where Jesus had healed the man that was let down from the roof in the Gospel of Mark, and they peeled it, uh, peeled the roof back, and they let the lame man down. And and Jesus, rather than telling him to get up and walk, Jesus says, "Your sins are forgiven." And the Pharisees were so upset because Jesus had said, "Your sins are forgiven," and they themselves said, "No one forgives sin except God," indicating that Jesus was God, the Messiah, God uh, in the flesh. So we know that no one forgives sins in that sense of our forgiveness of sin that we need from God. And so I don't think this is what Jesus is speaking of here. Um, part of it might be that as you go in the Holy Spirit and, and you're to carry on the commission, the mission that I've given you, uh, that, but I think the most plausible answer to this very difficult interpretation of this particular verse is that in the sense where we do forgive one another's sins when when we are sinned against. Jesus commanded us that we're to forgive one another. So many times in Scripture that is, is given to us. When asked how many times we forgive, Jesus said 70 times 7. So there's that. And so I think that's part of that gospel uh, message presentation that Jesus is speaking of there, that now not only do we have forgiveness with the Father, but we can have forgiveness with one another through the power of the Holy Spirit. To me, that's the most plausible uh, interpretation of this verse. But let me go back to the previous verse, because I think in context, this is exactly uh, what we're to get. He says, peace be with you, in verse 21, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, we've spoken a lot of times, and John has mentioned in his gospel, that the motivation for Jesus' coming, uh, while entailed in that, was so that he might die for our sins. But the primary motivation, as Jesus clearly made, was that he was being submissive to the will of the Father. In the garden, just prior to his crucifixion, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And so Jesus demonstrated to us his obedience to the will of the Father. That was his motivation, if you will, of coming, to be obedient to the will of the Father. And now he's saying to his apostles and he's saying to us, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. And so the motivation for our going, the motivation for our sharing the gospel with others it's not because we necessarily see their need for salvation. We certainly do that. We, we certainly see their need for salvation just as we have a need for salvation. But the preeminent thing here is that we be obedient to what Jesus Christ has commanded us to do. Let me just put it plainly. Y'all, sharing Christ, sharing the gospel with others is not a choice that we make. Well, it is a choice that we make. We make the choice to be obedient to what Christ commanded us. Our motivation should not pre preeminently be the motivation that others uh, be saved. Why, that is a motivation. Somebody just gave me an angry emoji. Uh, I hope that was an accident. But our motivation is that we want to be obedient to the will of Christ. He said in Matthew chapter 28, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. If we are not engaged in making disciples, and that, that includes um, not only that process of, of showing others how to follow Christ in the act of discipleship, but it begins with going and sharing the gospel. If we are not doing that, then we are being disobedient to the man, to the command of Christ. In one sense, it is an option. We make it an option. But when Jesus gave the command, when he commanded here, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you, we take Matthew 28, to go and make disciples. If we are not actively, intentionally engaged in that, then we are being disobedient to Christ. Bottom line, no other explanation to it whatsoever. So we need to take that seriously. I need to take that seriously, that that he has not saved me so that I can have a good life on this side. He's not saved me just so that I can be saved for salvation. He has, but he saved me and he requires obedience of me in my life. And so 
uh, if that's an area that I'm not being obedient to, I need to repent and turn and be intentionally engaged in going and making disciples. And that's true for me, and that's true for you as well. So let's do a check this morning. Are we being obedient? obedient to the command of Christ to go. As the Father has sent him, we also are going. It's not an option. It's a command. And let's pray this morning in closing that God gives us an opportunity to share the gospel, to plant a seed, to sow a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart today. If we recognize a seed has been planted there, that God give us the courage and God give us the wisdom to know how to cultivate that seed. And let's pray that God, by his grace, would allow us to see somebody come to know Christ today, that we'd witness somebody being saved. That would be a glorious day. But listen, again, I implore you, I beg you, I, I encourage you to come pray together tonight corporately as we pray and worship the risen King, the risen Savior. Tonight, 6 p.m., in the Children's Center, let's come and pray together. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, that he keep you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Please share these devotions on your feed uh, so we can get more people engaged in the Word of God. And I look forward to next Monday starting the book of Hebrews. Have a great day. God bless you.